بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد وبارك وسلم We are in Surah Al-Fatir Surah number 35 and number 3 and number 2 أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ما يفتح الله للناس من رحمة فلا ممسك لها وما يمسك فلا مرسل له من بعده وهو العزيز الحكيم In the previous ayah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that he created angels as messengers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appoints emissaries and agents so that they would provide human beings with facilities and services that arrange the affairs of the world as we know it. In this ayah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is now bringing our attention to the reality that it is Allah's decree and Allah's will that allows things to happen either way whether it's in a good way or in not so good a way so whatever Allah opens up for people of rahmah of grace and mercy there's no one there to stop and to withhold that rahmah from coming to the people and whatever Allah stops and withholds there is no one there to send to people uh, any kind of rahmah after his decree after his will has decided that there is no rahmah or mercy for this person why is this? وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ he is the all supreme and he is the all wise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has supremacy his might and power is influential in his decision making as his, his eternal wisdom there's always going to be hikmah divine hikmah and wisdom in whatever Allah has decided it is not without a purpose it may not necessarily always be logical and reasonable for people or immediately Mm, comprehensible to people but definitely there is a lot of divine wisdom which as we know takes place over many many millenniums and phases of existence okay. so here th- this ayah as with other ayat in the Quran speak to the um, enormous rahmah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created for uh, people and Allah guides those whom he wishes towards his rahmah the word rahmah in the Quran is used in so many different ways with so many different categories and uh, so many different phases and shades as we know and it will come out again in the other parts of the surah when we get there inshallah so even in one form of rahmah like rain or water there are so many grades and there are so many shades to his rahmah and so on so the Quran uses the word rahmah for rain also but the rain can go either way the rain can be very beneficial at the same time rain can also be very detrimental it's the same element which is being used differently so when Allah decrees that this rain is going to be beneficial no one will be able to say otherwise and likewise when Allah decrees this rain is going to be harmful then there is no one there to overrule what he has decided. Now this is the way that we appropriate Allah's creating the agents and the managers of the universe who follow his instructions. They don't have independent prerogatives to change or alter what Allah has decided. The previous ayah Allah has informed us that these are agents angels and they run the affairs of the world as Allah wants them to okay? <coughs> but they don't have the independent prerogative to change any order 
And they will do what Allah wants them to do with tremendous integrity, uh, precision, accuracy, etc. But they won't falter. Uh, so if rain is coming, it will be the same agents who will bring rain. Uh, now the ultimate um, what what's known as the utility of the rain will come from Allah's decree. So that doesn't change anything. Yeah. So angels don't have volition. They do what they are supposed to do. They're ordered to do, although they do it with an amazing amount of strength. So they have immense strength and immense intellectual capabilities. But they don't have volition. So what Allah creates, other than the jinn and the human being, there's very little volition, if any at all. And that is why the address to human beings is that ma yaftahillahu nas, whatever Allah has opened up for people, where people have volition. They have the ability to do good or bad. So Allah has created a knife. And if you have a knife with sharp edges on both sides, it will cut on both sides with both sides. That's what you mean, a double-edged sword. So you may use to cut something that's useful. And you may use the blade to cut something that will be detrimental. It's the same tool. Likewise, angels who are somewhat above the knife in as far as being animate, right? They do have the ability to intellectualize, conceptualize, to debate, and they have power uh, of their own. They live and exist as their own species. But they will serve only Allah's will. And so their volition is removed, whereas the volition of human beings is now implanted within the human. So if a human being wants to use water to benefit people, he may do so. And if the human being wants to use water to destroy people, he may do so. Right? The angels won't do that. The angels, they don't have volition. They follow Allah's command. So they don't have a say in the consequence of what Allah decides. Where human beings have a say in the consequence of what they decide. And that's the point of the two systems. One system is angelic, and the other system is now divine, okay, which is eye number two, and the third eye is now human, in that order. If you read those eye together, you get a sense of the cosmological harmony that Allah is presenting in these ayat in Surah Al-Fatih. So as part of the angel's fitrah, they will deliver the message, good or bad. They will complete the act, good or bad. Right? As far as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He decides what He decides. There's no one there to judge and overrule Him. As far as human beings, they have to decide through their behavior as to whether they want to generate a good result or a bad result. And hence, ayah number three will now flow with this vein. Ya ayyuhal nas, adhkuru ni'matullahi alaykum. O mankind, remember Allah and His ni'mah upon you. Ni'matullahi alaykum. Remember Allah's ni'mah, favor upon you. So now, here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking the human being to use his volition to appreciate who Allah is. Okay. Allah gives you a ni'mah, and that comes from Him. So appreciate the mun'im, the one who's providing you with the ni'mah, and don't get too absorbed with the ni'mah itself. Allah has given you money and wealth and children, mashallah, and all of this, all this ni'mah. Then don't be over-consumed with the ni'mah and the blessings in such a way that you forget who gave them to you in the first place. And that is the meaning of dhikr. Remember Allah's ni'mah upon you. Why? هَلْ مِنْ خَالِقٍ غَيْرُ اللَّهِ يَرْزُقُكُمْ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ Is there any other creator besides Allah who can give you risk from
from the heavens and the earth. So Allah provides you rizq, favors of nourishment and nutrition from the heavens in the form of rain, as we just saw, or ard in the form of vegetation, and upon the earth in the form of animals that you eat after you sacrifice them or you slaughter them. Um, so there is no one there besides Allah who is going to create this for you. Allah will provide risk for you through the system of angels that manage the affairs of the world. But you, when you become a recipient of that message which is delivered, the delivery, then you must remember Allah as the one who gives you and not forget that no one else can replace Allah. Where Allah may replace you and the ni'mah. Allah can replace you and replace the ni'mah he gives you. So one time, one day you may be well off, another day, God forbid, you may not be so well off. One day you may have a job, the next day you may not have a job. One day you'll feel good, the next day you'll feel lousy. Feeling good is a ni'mah. Feeling lousy, I don't think it's a ni'mah. Unless you're prone to be a masochist and you like to be depressed and suppressed and annoyed and agitated all the time. <laughs> anyway, so Allah is now saying that look at all three. So in the fitrah uh, of the angels, there is no volition, they deliver. In Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is Al Fatir. He, he is the one who creates originally uh, as the ayah begins, the first ayah. Alhamdulillah, Fatir is Samarat. In the third ayah, in the fitrah of human beings, there is shukr. In the nature of human beings, there is what? Shukr, which is implied by the word dhikr. Remember Allah's ni'mah, meaning appreciate what Allah has given you in the form of all of these blessings and bounties in our mouth, because that's in your fitrah, that's in your instinctive, that is the purpose of your creation. So in the fitrah of angels, they deliver. In Allah, he is al-fatir. And in you, the fitrah is shukr. And remembering the munim, the one who gives you the ni'mah. And hence you tie all three ayat together in the theme of the surah, al-fatir. La ilaha illahu, there is no one worthy of worship except he. There is no one who can be called a deity except he. There is no one there whom you should worship except he. And this Allah subhanahu is saying, that you worship the one who is in control of both the ni'mah and also the one who delivers, that is the angel. So the angels deliver your ni'mah and you worship not the ni'mah, nor do you worship the delivery system, nor are you only worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the only one worthy of being called the deity because he has the absolute prerogative to do what he wants to do at will, without anyone uh, asking him why. So how can you then turn away, meaning from his ni'mah, and also from him, both, that you don't turn away from Allah's blessings, and you don't turn away from worshipping the one who gave you the blessings. This is a reminder for all of mankind. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-fatir, the one who creates without any blueprint, and the one who creates at will, whatever he wants. When you kaddibuka, faqad kuddibat rusulun min qablik. Now the address changes to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. In ayah number three, the initial address is to people. Ya yuhun nas, O people. In this ayah, the address now changes to the Prophet ﷺ, that if they are to reject you, then uh, you must know and believe that many messengers before you were also rejected. Meaning this, unfortunately, is part of human history. Although it is not part of humans' fitrah. Anything that goes against the fitrah is a deviance, is غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين in that sense. They're not on the straight path. They have diverted themselves or distracted themselves. Or they have become deviant within themselves. And this has been throughout human history. 
So in the human history, you will see that many people denied and denied the messengers from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, O oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if you feel that your being denied is something that depresses you or overwhelms you, then you must find reassurance in the other messengers who came before you, where they also denied. But they also, but they succeeded okay, in the sense that they delivered the message. And then hence you are the last of these messengers, you will also succeed. Why? Because only to Allah that all the affairs of the world and the universe will return. All matters of truth and falsehood will eventually go back to Allah, either in this world or in the world hereafter. If Allah has appointed you as his messenger, meaning you are a messenger like the angelic messenger. The angel is also Rasul. Allah appoints angels as Rasul messengers, and he also appoints human beings as messengers, as we did last week. Allah is the min al malaikati rusul wa min nas. That ayah at the end of Surah Hajj tells us that. So you, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you are in the line of all messengers that are appointed by the divine, except that you're human. And when you're a human being, the message will be received by human beings like you, who will not, will not like you. Because they're human. Human beings are rebellious, and they're arrogant, and they're proud, and they're stubborn, they're stuck in their ways, and they're argumentative, and so on and so forth. So because it's unfortunate that their, their tradition or their culture or their civilization or their surroundings, their environment have changed them from being grateful people into being ungrateful people, they will show their ingratitude towards you by rejecting you and not by showing gratitude for the ni'mah in you, which is wahi. Because when somebody rejects a messenger of God, a nabi or rasul, he is rejecting the ni'mah that Allah has given him. What is the ni'mah Allah has given a Nabi? Wahi. Knowledge of the unseen, knowledge from the unseen, knowledge that is not accessible to other human beings. So this sparks a level of arrogance or hasad, jealousy or pride or stubbornness. And hence you are the recipient of those unfortunate, miserable elements within the human being that otherwise would remain dormant. So the Nabi uh, must realize that he is dealing with a community of human beings who will do what they do. And what do they do? They reject the truth. فَقَدْ كُذِّبَتْ رُسُلُونَ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ Messengers before you have been denied and belittled and denied and refused and rejected. All of that. It is not new. So human beings, when they become a collective force and they want to maintain whatever it is they have established in their minds, they will not let go of it that easily. Likewise with your message, uh, people will not let go of their ideals that easily. But you must remember, وَإِلَى اللَّهِ تُرِيَ الْأُمُورِ It is only towards Allah that all of these matters will be eventually delivered. And Allah will be the judge of who is right and who is wrong. And since Allah is the one who appointed you, you will be ultimately right. Ya ayyuhal nas, inna wa'ad Allahi haqqun, fala taqurrannakum al-hayat al-dunya, wa la yuqurrannakum billahi al-qurur. Then Allah readdresses all of mankind. All mankind, indeed, Allah's promise is the truth. The ultimate truth, what is that? that all affairs and matters will go back to him and he will rule and decide on every issue and every matter that is necessary for human beings to know. That is his promise. And the haq, the truth, will come out when he rules and when he decides this is right and this is wrong. So if you have any fear of God or if you believe that you will be resurrected after you die, then let not the world and life in this world now delude you, deceive you, and beguile you, and trick you 
into assuming that your life will finish and terminate here and it will not be extended after death. Because there's another phase of human existence that's called the afterlife and there Allah will rule and judge in favor of those who uphold, upheld the truth in this world. And the truth is not just that is micro in this world, it is macro as it extends to the world of the graves and the day of judgment and beyond that. And do not let the chief deceiver deceive you. Referring to Iblis. He's the chief of all those who deceive. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing all the human beings that you are all going to be faced with this one being known as Iblis or the devil or Satan or whatever you like to call him. His fitrah unfortunately has become so distorted that he believes deceiving people is good. In the fitrah of angels, they know that following Allah's orders is good. In the fitrah of Iblis, he believes that disobeying God is good. And making sure that others disobey God is his mission in life. So he's al qahur Totally, totally uh, deceived yeah. in his uh, narcissism. He's narcissistic, the devil. I'm always right. And if I'm wrong, it's because somebody else uh, made me do it. So he blamed God for not bowing down to Adam. That's how, unfortunately, the devil then controls the minds and behavior of the people. The devil, obviously, as the Prophet said, is within us. He's not a foreign entity. He's not alien to us. He's part of us, part of our system. He's always insinuating. He's there in our blood, in our bloodstream. So we must not assume that he's some demon outside of there that comes from the heavens or from hell. No, he's right here, inside us. That's the one we have to address. Not something that's kind of external to us. Right? The beat the devil out of him. The devil will never leave you. <laughs> he's not designed that way. He loves you. So he lives with you. He is your resident evil. Within you, not in your house. There's the devil in the house. No, the devil's in you. Take care of that devil first. So that's why you say, All the Billahi in the Shaitan Rajim. Even when you're reading the Quran, because he's going to deceive you when you read the Quran. That's his job. He's not going to give up his job because you're reading the Quran. That you are doing salat. He's doing salat, let the brother pray. He said, let me deceive him because he's praying. This brother is a good Muslim, so let me let him now. Because he's a good Muslim, I have to deceive him even more. That's his fitrah, which he has turned his fitrah upside down. He's inverted the paradigm of good against the angels, because the angels' paradigm is good. They cannot disobey God, even if they were given a volition. But they're not given volition, so they can't disobey him. لا يعصون الله ما مرهم The devil, on the other hand, unfortunately, has become so corrupt that he can only deceive human beings, except the prophets. He will not be able to deceive any Nabi, any prophet. That's how Allah has safeguarded the institution of Nabu and prophethood. Yeah. Allah then says to us, "Inna shaytan lakum aduun, fatakhiduhu aduwa." Indeed, the devil is your enemy. He is your sworn enemy. So make him your enemy. Fatakhiduhu aduwa. So when he comes and insinuates, uh, maybe I should do this. I should do this. And you know he's going to displease Allah. And you know he's going to displease the prophet. And you know he's going to make a mess of things in the world. And it's going to cause disunity and corruption and commotion and chaos and all of that. Bloodshed. Then you must make sure that he's the one who is your enemy. The human being in front of the devil or where the devil resides, the human being is not the enemy. The enemy is within that human whom you seek to destroy or damage. So how do you do that? How do you kill the devil without killing the human? Right? You follow the prophet. Why do you follow the prophet? 
because prophets aren't deceived by the devil. How do you make the devil your enemy? By following the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, because he's the only Nabi we know. Right? We don't know any other Nabi except the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. How do we know of Musa and Isa and Yusuf? Because we know Muhammad wasallam. The Quran came to Muhammad wasallam. We have no direct access to any other Nabi except our Nabi Muhammad wasallam. So how did he deal with the devil? Okay, you do what he did, then you will not be deceived by the devil. So in your matters of aqidah, you follow him. In your matters of ibadah, you follow him. In your matters of what is halal, haram, you follow him. In your matters of behavior with other people, you follow him. That's called the sunnah. And when you follow the sunnah, you will not be deceived unless your nafs gets the better of you and you start to deceive yourself. Then you're in trouble. Oh, then you need a shaykh. <laughs> then you have to go to the self brothers, unfortunately. Oh, you can't rely on the Quran and Sunnah when the nafs is over you. Oh, I'm following the Quran and Sunnah, so I need to beat my wife. Oh, then, you, uh, then you're messed up. Yeah, so you don't use the Quran and Sunnah to fight. You don't use the Quran and Sunnah to, uh, to uh, create disunity and discord in the Ummah. You don't use the Quran and Sunnah as a weapon. Quran and Sunnah is a rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the devil and the nafs will make sure that you use the Quran and Sunnah as a weapon to justify and validate whatever it is you're doing. Uh, that's what the devil did. Right? Allah said to yeah, the angels and the devil, bow down in front of Adam. And then the devil said uh, that you made me from this. It's your fault that you made me from fire. You justify sin by blaming God. Right? And unfortunately some Muslims do the same. They justify sin by using the Quran and Sunnah. That's where you need a human guide. Not just abstract knowledge. You need a human being to tell you, hey, this is right and this is wrong. And you follow the method of the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba. And the Tabi'un who followed the Sahaba in matters of deen. So here Allah is saying that make the devil your enemy. It has to be a concerted effort. It has to be a very proactive effort. It has to be someone that you realize is your enemy. And unless you do that uh, on a daily basis, you will not understand this ayah. Well, I know the devil is my, my enemy. No, you don't. It's not about thinking about it. The devil is saying that I need to commit this sin. And you say, you're my enemy, so get lost. Allah in the Kick him out from your system. He won't stop. Likewise, you can't stop. If you stop once, the devil, you have to remember, only has to get lucky once. You have to get lucky every time. That's the difference. Yeah. You know, I did it the other day, I stayed away. Okay, what about the next day? I'm sorry, my nafs got the better of me. There you go, the devil won. You didn't see him as an enemy, you saw him as a friend. Because what he does is that he decorates sin in your mind and temptation and all of that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that if you want to create harmony between you and the other order in the heavens, then follow the order of the angels and then resist the temptation to displease Allah and to not follow the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, because this is the devil's job. Allah made him that evil so that there would be evil in the world. Okay, that's just a cosmic reality. Deal with it. Right? So why did God create snakes so that they can bite human beings? So deal with it. You can't blame the snake. You have to deal with the snake when it comes in front of you. Right? You can't blame God for creating the devil as a devil. That's just what it is. What's his job? Allah says, إِنَّمَا يَدْعُوا حِزْبَهُ لِيَكُونُوا مِنْ أَصْحَابِ السَّعِيرِ That he calls his group. Yeah. The devil has a hizb and he has a da'wah. Yeah. Yeah. 
the devil gives dharma to. Innama yadu hisbal. Why? So that human beings will end up as the companions of the fire, of the hell. So he said that if God is going to punish me in hell, then I want all human beings to join me. That's his mission. So he's not going to let go until the final human being on the planet breathes his last. And he will be with that person also. And that's what he's made for. Just as angels are made to deliver Allah's message, likewise the devil is made to unfortunately lead human beings into the fire. And that's how we should see him and his hordes and his uh, stooges and his helpers. They all are part of his hizb, his group, whether you say it's alliance or just a group. It doesn't have to be necessarily an alliance. Anyway, so eventually and consequentially, those people who become part of his group, they will end up in the fire. And you don't want to do that. And obviously, that requires requires a certain amount of strength and resilience and resistance and patience and all of that good stuff. Right. So when Allah has given you the ability to resist, that's a ni'mah. Use that ni'mah to resist every temptation all the time. And the way you do that is that you scorn the devil. Allah has given everybody a certain amount of hatred. Right? We have genes that stimulate hatred in us. That's fine. Why are those genes there? To help us hate the devil. Not human beings, but the devil. The devil is a jinn, as you know. He's not human. Although there are some human beings who would probably make the devil run away from him also. Really? Unfortunately. But in, in nature, he's, he's from the jinn kind. So you make sure that you start to hate the devil as your enemy. And that will develop within you a resistance. And when you have this resistance, I'm not going to do what the devil wants me to do. Then you become pious. It's part of Allah's divine construct. The cosmic harmony with which Allah creates all human beings. The fitrah, as the name of the surah is now informing us, Allah has create human being on this uh, without any prototype that the human being has the ability to to be seduced towards something that is appealing and uh, human being also has the ability to resist anything that is detrimental both you, know, you have to be able to manage yourselves in such a way that you don't cause yourselves harm and eventual punishment in the fire well, if that happens, الَّذِينَ كَفَرُ لَهُمْ عَذَابٌ شَدِيدٌ Those who disbelieve and they succumb to the temptations of the devil and the nafs and they do not believe in Allah and they commit the eventual fateful kufr, then for them there is a very severe punishment as the punishment fits the crime. You don't believe in the one who gave you life. You don't believe in the one who gave you all of these uh, benefits and um, bounties and ni'am, then obviously the one who is going to judge you will say to you also, you didn't believe in me, so now this is your punishment. Then the devil's work is done. You now heed it to the devil's calling, and then the devil will see you there where he is. So this is a warning to all human beings that they must not go against the fitrah of tawheed. La ilaha illahu. You must believe Allah is in control. So Allah's ni'mah, it comes in the form of obedience. And you must adhere to that obedience as a ni'mah. And Allah shows his fadl to you by allowing you to offer salat, so zakat and hajj. And to stay away from what is wrong. See it as a ni'mah. And see it as a gift from Allah. And then when you are tempted by the devil, see the devil as an open enemy. And then God forbid if you succumb to that, you make tawbah. But you don't give up hope in Allah. When you give up hope in Allah, that's kufr. And it is to this that Quran is referring to. 
those who start to disbelieve in the existence of God because they're not able to do what God wants them to do, then they lose hope and then eventually they lose faith, which is kufr. A denial in the existence of God, either through atheism, God forbid, or the man hafiz, or just downright being arrogant and agnostic. I don't care anymore. So you become heedless in life and then you lead a life of uh, uh, ignorance in behavior and in, in your your moral anarchy. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may indeed take you to task. وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ لَهُمْ مَغْفِرَةٌ وَأَجْرٌ كَبِيرٌ as far as those people who believe and do good deeds, good deeds is on the back of belief in Allah, belief in one Allah, belief in the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That should prompt you to do better and to do good deeds in general. Good deeds are then qualified with your iman and faith in Allah and your trust in Allah. When you are God-fearing, then your deeds will also represent that God consciousness and awareness and you will not, as I said, uh, sow the seeds of disunity and discord and chaos and confusion amongst people, especially in the name of deen and relig- religion and so on. For these people who do good deeds, uh, for them there is maghfirah. There is now eternal forgiveness and pardon for whatever they did. And on top of that, ajrun kabir. And there is tremendous, huge reward. So on forgiveness, there is reward and not just the pardon. And you can leave the prison cell and then see if you make it in life or not. So I'll pardon you from hell. And you can roam around here somewhere, where you want. No. That's not how a Kareem does his work. Allah is al-Kareem. He is noble and generous. And he is al-Ghani. He is independent of you and you will worship and everything else. So he will then honor you and favor you with rewarding you after forgiveness. Right? That's why we ask for reward as we ask for forgiveness. It would be very naive for anyone to assume that we don't ask for reward and forgiveness at the same time. That's not how the day of judgment will work. The day of judgment will work with forgiveness and then with reward. That's why human beings should definitely make dua. Allah gives us reward along with maghfirah. Mm. Yeah. So here we see that the, the uh, fitrah, the natural disposition upon which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created everything. Allah is fatir as-samawati wal as mentioned in the first ayah. And for that we praise Allah that without any blueprint, he has already organized uh, the uh, way that everything in the universe should work. And everything works according to its predetermined nature. Instinct, if you want to call it, or fitrah. Human beings have a predetermined nature to worship Allah. And unfortunately, the devil made himself, through corrupting himself, out of pride and arrogance and jealousy and kufr to become evil. So now his evil is not necessarily innate. It is something that is acquired. Before he refused to bow down in front of Adam, he was a good guy. Right? All of you know that, right? Iblis was not Iblis before. He refused to obey Allah's command. So his evilness is acquired. It's not innate. You have to make that distinction when you're talking about the devil and the original sin or whatever you have to call it. Whichever the religion you discuss. In Islam we see the devil as being originally trying to mimic the angels. That's why he was in the company of angels when Allah gave the command. He was there. He was trying to be an angel and become part of someone of the group who is close to Allah. Through his arrogance and his jealousy, uh, he became evil, almost incarnate, right? Almost. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the leave to do what he wanted to do and deceive Adam and his offspring. 
Now we are saying to human beings that don't follow the devil, follow your instinct, which is good, which is based on the fitrah upon which Allah has created you. That fitrah is tawheed, la ilaha illallah. Follow that and then you will be saved and you will be back into Jannah where you belong, where you came from. And in Jannah you will be rewarded immensely. And this is the message and the da'wah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls towards Darus Salaam. Wallahu yad'u ila Darus Salaam. Wa yahdi man yasha. So Allah gives da'wah towards Jannah, the abode of peace, Darus Salaam. And here, innama yad'u hizbahu liyakunu min ashabi sa'ir. The devil has a da'wah. The devil invites people to become part of the companions of hell. Allah invites people to become inhabitants and citizens of Jannah. So now on earth you have this tension. One is an acquired deficiency from one being, and that is Iblis, and the other is the innate goodness that is in all human beings. When the two collide, then you end up on earth where the stage is set between good and evil. If good overcomes, then Allah will forgive and Allah will reward. If evil overcomes, then is no one's fault except the one who committed the evil. And that will be the human being, not the devil. The devil's already doomed. Okay, his destiny is sealed. The destiny of a human being is not sealed. Human beings have volition. They can still make a choice here on earth so that they go back to where they belong, which is Jannah. We make dua Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the tawfiq to do what pleases him the most and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us and preserve us from the devil and his temptations and insinuations. Um, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us and preserve us from making, uh, committing sins and forgive us. Ameen ya rabbal alameen. Sallallahu ta'ala ala khayla khilqi. محمد وآله وصحابه أجمعين برحمتك يا أحمد الرحمن الرحيم